Thank you so much, Teddy and Nicoleta. It seems that being the founding president of Aspen Romania is the most important uh, title in my, and it is. And I remember many years back uh, when I was working with Heather Conley, my dear friend and our dear friends from, from GMF. So basically Aspen in Romania and GMF in the Black Sea region uh, were basically established about the same time. And I'm proud and privileged to have been playing a role in the creation of both. And that's why with Heather Conley and our GMF friends, with Clara and all the colleagues here, my colleagues from Aspen Institute, I think we have an obligation, an obligation to, to be not only the beneficiaries of the enlargement of the Euro-Atlantic community, and Heather in her official capacity uh, back in the day, we are part of the most bold, ambitious, and multi-regional enlargement of NATO, the 2004, with seven nations from the Baltic to the Black Sea. I think the time has come for our region, not only to be the ones who are newcomers into the Euro-Atlantic structures, but to prove ourselves as a cornerstone, and if I can say intellectually equal, core thinkers of Europe's future, of our region's future, and of the world's future. So I'd like to thank you from the bottom of my heart to both organizations. I, I'm, I'm so much proud to see how the Bucharest Forum is thriving. And a little bit of commercial outside of the, the sponsors that are always exceptionally important. I believe this is one of those places where we can really see not only strategic conversations, they do happen in many places. Not only economic conversations, they do happen in many places. And not only technological or sectorial conversations, they do happen in many, many places. But this is one of the places where you can see an intersection of geopolitics with geoeconomics and transformative trends, not only in world affairs, but also in our economies, in our militaries and our societies. And I think this is also a multi-regional role that this forum plays. And I see my good friend uh, Basat, uh, uh, my good old friend, I'm missing the Turkish coffee that you are bringing to my office uh, uh, back, in, back in Brussels. But let me say uh, a few things about this region. And I never treated the Black Sea region as a standalone region. I think this is a is, this is a way for us to say that everything is intertwined. There's no region in the world, there is no activity in, in the world that doesn't have an interconnecting part attached to it, none. From cyber to space, and from military to politics, and from economy to climate change, everything is interconnected. And I want you to, to start thinking for these two days of the way in which these things together are changing the fundamental nature, not only of geopolitics, but of human societies, of our economic models, of our social contracts, of our democratic, in the case of our nations, values. Because we have seen geopolitical competition in human history many times. This is relatively nothing new but we've never seen such a transformation in every single aspect of human life, of our planet's life, and the fundamentals of our democracies. Coming back to our region, we are seeing an incredible unity across the transatlantic world. I'll start with this. And I have to say that I want to thank, on behalf of the leadership of NATO, but also as a Romanian, to the allies who have stepped up their presence in our part of the alliance when the crash of, of a drone similar to those used by Russian military a few months ago on Romanian territory was concerning. The U.S. deployed additional F-16s to bolster NATO air policing in Romania. Other allies have done the same. 
And I want to, to say that I'm very proud that I think on Monday, the official opening of the F-16 training hub for Ukrainian, Romanian and allied pilots in Romania will take place. I would like to thank the Netherlands, Denmark and the other allies in the F-16 coalition. This is really something not too short of remarkable. I want to thank all the ones, including private sector, uh, involved in this. Tomorrow I'll be visiting Bulgaria and the Bell Group led by Italy in our uh, neighbor to the south. And I believe that this is something that together with Turkey, the demining exercise together, the other multi-regional dimensions are also very much important. But if we look to this region from a little bit of a higher altitude, we can see with no, absolutely no doubt that we are in the midst of a geopolitical earthquake. War is back in Europe and the Middle East. Tensions are rising in other corners of our planet. Terrorists strike anyone, anywhere, at any time. The horrific Hamas attack in Israel last month is all on our minds. And of course, we also have to keep in mind and help also the ones, civilians and others, that need our help. And I know that we'll be able to do this together. Authoritarian regimes are openly undermining our democratic values and putting pressure on global rules. Climate change is multiplying crises around the world. New technologies, like never ever before in human history, are disrupting our daily lives faster than ever before and making the complexity of transformation immensely difficult to cope for governments, for corporations, and for civil society. China is buying up critical infrastructure in Europe, and undersea pipelines in the Baltic Sea are being damaged, and investigations are going on. So yes, as President Biden said, we are at the global inflection point. And yes, as Chancellor Scholz said, the center of gravity in Europe is moving east. And yes, as President Macron said in Chisinau just a few months back, the time has come, the distinction between older and newer members of both EU and NATO, NATO-EU, should start to diminish and eventually make room to a new political, economic and strategic new center of gravity on our continent. We are at the point on which our unity and solidarity of our democracies around the world are being tested more than ever. Together we stand up and defend a world of freedom, prosperity and peace. And for us in this part of the world, we have witnessed also, at least my generation, also the other side of darkness. I can say that there is nothing probably more precious than our freedom. Democracy, imperfect as it might be, disappointments as they accumulate in our societies for reasons that are real and others that are just adding up. That I think our new democracies, our, our, our new part partnership with the democratic West, I think our region has an even bigger obligation to defend these values. Because we know how the other side looks like. We know what the lack of freedom looks like. We know what dictatorship looks like. We know what oppression looks like. And I think we have to be strong enough inside to be able to resist the temptations that do arise in many of our societies, but I think we have an obligation to speak up, stand up, and act as the staunchest defenders of freedom and democracy, because this is who we are, and this is we, what we should be continuing to be doing. What is NATO doing? We're doing, I would say, and I'm proud to serve together with Sergei John Stoltenberg. He sends you his best regards. He, he, he remembers fondly his presence on this stage last year. I think this alliance of ours that will be celebrating 75 years since our inception in Washington in July of next year, I don't know what happened during the Cold War, but I know that we, I've never seen a bigger more profound transformation of this alliance ever. 
In Vilnius, our leaders approved the most ambitious deterrence and defense plans and adaptation of this alliance in generations. More forces, more resources, more exercises, more equipments, multi-domain operations. And I want to say again for this region, which is strategically complex, that these plans, including the ones for the Black Sea and all force of the Balkans and Mediterranean, are to be implemented fully. And I know on the way to Washington, allies and us and our military leaders will be implementing these plans and make them executable, real, and thus playing a deterrence role. We're also helping Ukraine. And there are many voices that are saying that we should be aware of some sort of Ukraine fatigue. And here from Bucharest and here from this part of Europe, I can say that we don't have the luxury to become tired. Because the fight of our Ukrainian friends is also our fight. Because the shape of European security architecture will depend on the outcome of this war that Russia started so brutally against Ukraine. And because many of the things around the world will depend on the outcome of this, of this war. I would like to thank every single ally and partners of NATO for the support they are providing. I know that it's in, re in, in our region there are many questions about many things. I agree there are things that need to be addressed, but by and large, continuing in supporting Ukraine is the best thing we can do, the only thing we can do, and I know that is the thing that we'll continue to be doing together. Yesterday I chaired the NATO-Ukraine Council on Energy Security, and we had a fantastic briefing from our Ukrainian friends on how they are preparing against what will be very realistically another attempt by Russia to destroy the energy infrastructure during winter time weaponizing energy, not only against military of Ukraine, but also the people of Ukraine, to keep them in the dark and in the cold. This is so in inhuman. And this is something that I know that Ukraine and all of us are much better prepared than last year. But this is something that we anticipate will happen also during this winter, which is approaching. We also are working on investing more in our defense. Only last year, European allies and Canada had a rise of 8.3%, the real term uh, of, of the defense budget increase. And the countries in Central Eastern Europe are leading by example. Next year, Poland plans to spend over 4% of GDP on defense, more than any other ally. Our Baltic allies are spending close to 3%. Romania is spending 2.5%. This is really good news. We need that not only to ask for our bigger allies to come and be with us, but also have to do our part of the job. And I know that our region will do the job. We also are ramping up our defense industrial production foundation. Because now we don't see that much of a political problem in continuing helping Ukraine, but we see also a physical limitation of our industrial base. And that NATO Defense Production Action Plan is an encouragement for allies, including for the ones in this region, to really start thinking together with the other allies in how to making sure that the whole of NATO countries also benefit from these additional resources invested in defense. And as I mentioned, intellectually, we have to be co-authors in thinking. I think we have to be also co-authors in manufacturing and exporting. And I think this is a fair deal. And I encourage bigger and smaller allies to think creatively and do things together and making sure that jobs and money and the ripple effect of a strong, robust defense and dual use technology sector is benefiting everyone across the Alliance. And I know that uh, there are many people in this room that can contribute to my appeal. Let me also say something about our partnerships. I mentioned Ukraine. I am personally and institutionally exceptionally proud and happy to have heard 
President von der Leyen and the European Commission giving their green light for Ukraine, the Republic of Moldova, to start negotiations to joining the EU. This is nothing short of remarkable. I want to applaud our EU colleagues and strategic partners for the boldness and the leadership that they are taking. And I do hope that also European leaders in the Council that will be held in the next few weeks will give the green light. Natalia Gavrilica, the former Prime Minister of Moldova, is here. I talked to Prime Minister Rachan, he visited us. I talked to President Maya Sandu. President Maya Sandu indicated in a fantastic speech in the Parliament in Chisinau that her ambition and her administration's ambition is to have the Republic of Moldova joining the EU by 2030. I'm not here to say, on behalf of my institution, how fast and, and how profound this thing would go, but as a joint partner, NATO-EU, with the Republic of Moldova, I can say, respecting neutrality of Moldova, that we are fully behind the European perspective for our brothers and sisters and our friends in Moldova, in Ukraine. I'm also happy that Georgia, an indispensable partner of our democratic world across the Black Sea, and a linchpin towards the Caucasus and Central Asia have been granted by the Commission yesterday, of course, pending approval by EU leaders, the status of candidate. And I'm also very happy to see that our friends in Bosnia and Herzegovina, another partner of NATO, that are conditional candidate status on the way ahead. I would say that the direct impact of Russia's absurd and counterproductive to their interest, war against Ukraine, that I know, and that's the mission I think all of us have, that we have the whole region, the whole region of the Black Sea, of the Western Balkans, everyone in Europe wishing and, and being ready to join our family of nations, that I think that in the next decade we'll see the whole part of Europe as I was dreaming with Heather some 20 years back, Heather, to see a Europe whole and free from the Baltic to the Black Sea, I think we'll see a Europe whole and free much closer to its geographical boundaries. This is nothing short of remarkable. Let me say just a final word about things that are interconnected as well. And you are here a crowd of super professionals from all walks of life. Please do not think and act in silos. It's not one group of strategic thinkers. There's not another group of politicians. There's not another group of business leaders. There's not a group of intellectual leaders. There's not a, another group of technologists and startup and innovation ecosystems. We have to start thinking more holistically about what kind of societies and as I mentioned in a, in, a, in a speech a few days back, we see a new, a new equilibrium being shaped between economy and security, technology and society. And I think there's no better place than Aspen Institute and GMF to look into this very dynamic new equilibrium which is to be made. Do not think in silos. Everything is interconnected. Every new technology that I'm working, I chair the Innovation Board in NATO, on generative AI, on quantum computing, on biotechnology, on human enhancement, on new materials, on space, on cyberspace, on everything you want, has dual use, civilian military in nature. Would not be creating one AI for ChatGPT and another AI for controlling nuclear and military sophisticated operations. It's one thing. It can be switched from one to another of its functions. So between the economy and security, there is a indispensable interlinkage. Don't be afraid to work with each other. There's been a resistance, especially in the innovation world, to work with our defense industrial base. No, we need each other. China is using the fusion between state, economy, military and intelligence in one piece. In the 60s, in America, 90% of technologies that are, were used for military purposes and national security were produced by, private se by, by public sector, by government. 90% today are produced by the private sector. 
We have to find a way to communicate with, with each other. And I believe that this is what is the role of NATO. I'm very proud that we managed to establish the, a collection of uh, test centers and accelerators in Diana. I'm happy that Romania has, for the time being, two participants, one in University of Polytechnic of Bucharest, my alma mater, and the other one in INCAS, at the Air, and, and Air Defense Innovation Center. We established an innovation fund. If there are startup uh, uh, people around this room, please look it up. If you have an interesting idea, we're ready also to invest in your business and leave you with, with equity in your pocket as you cross the valley of death towards the markets. So, we are living a global inflection point, and I think this region of ours is probably one of the testing beds of a European security architecture, of a global commercial and economic architecture. And please do not look to this region disconnected from the greater Middle East, from the greater Black Sea region, from the Balkans, from Central Europe, and I see in the constellation of participants and supporters this multi-regional dimension. When it comes to my country, Romania, I'm not here to speak too much about, about, this, about this issue, but I can tell you something as, as a Romanian as a, and as, as a, I would think of as a political leader in a way. I think that each of the countries in our region have a multidimensional, multi-regional role to play. Romania is a key player in the Black Sea with many of our friends and allies and partners, but is also a key player in the Western Balkans, a key player in Central, in Central Europe, and could be a key player again in the Greater Middle East. Each of our nations have this potential of being multi-regional and polydimensional. This is what the Bucharest Forum is all about, to try to bring together these different pieces, sometimes difficult to connect, but indispensable for all of us in order to defend our democracies, our values, and uh, Teddy Dimitrescu, whom I thank for his remarkable work at the helm of the Institute, and to Vlad and to the others, and Clara and our GMF colleagues. Indeed, you're right. At least for the time being, the founding president of Aspen Institute seems to be the most remarkable thing of my career. Thank you all so much. Keep up the good work. Success and continue.